Great, we'll, we'll get started. Well, I thank you everyone for joining us for this uh, uh, Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness Day at REI. And it is my great pleasure to, uh, to uh, introduce you to the, today's uh, uh, 12 noon program, uh, favorite campsites, lakes and places in the BWCA with uh, Kim, uh, Kim Young. Kim is uh, a former board member of Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness, is a contributor to the Boundary Waters Journal, and has a wealth of knowledge about the Boundary Waters. I'm uh, Chris Knopp, the Executive Director of Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness. We have uh, for over 40 years protected, preserved uh, the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness and the Greater Quetico Superior Ecosystem. And uh, uh, it has been wonderful to work with, with uh, Kim over these years here and, and benefit from her, from her knowledge here. Uh, a couple of logistics before we get started with today's program. At the bottom of your screen there, there's a, a question and answer tab and a chat tab. You may place comments and questions in there and I'll try to respond to them as, as Kim gives her presentation. Um, at uh, just a, a, a final note that uh, at Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness, our supporters are our strength here. And so uh, we are always grateful, never forget that all of you are the strength of our organization. And, uh, and thank you for, for being here this afternoon. So again, uh, Kim Young, an expert on all things Boundary Waters, and it's uh, my pleasure to turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Kim, and thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Chris, that was a nice introduction. Good afternoon, everyone, it is noon. So I'm really happy to be here to share some of my knowledge about the Boundary Waters, some classic routes and some favorite lakes. And this is a picture of Clearwater Lake taken in 2021. I was there last year with a bunch of friends. Note the haze, there were quite a few fires last year and hopefully we won't have that this year. So I'll be talking about this particular trip later on in the presentation. So here are the lakes and some of the routes that I'm going to go over with you. I will give you some practical information and some points of interest along the way. Some routes are in and out, some are base camping and some are loops. The last trip I'm going to talk about is a trip that I did this past February in the winter. So um, I went to see some pictographs and I'll show you that at the end. For this presentation, I'm going to use a mixture of the classic canoe country maps from, from my vintage book, W.A. Fisher. And I'm going to use some newer maps from the Voyager Map Incorporated Company. There's 10 of those. So there's lots of other maps that you could use. However, this just made it easier for me to show you the, over, the larger picture overall and then to get more specific with the Voyager maps. For instance, here's the classic Fisher map and the Voyager map side by side. You can see the difference. The Voyager maps have topographical lines, but so do the new Fisher maps. So, so this particular trip, you would start at Moose, Moose River North, which is number 16 off the Echo Trail. One of the things I want you to notice right now on the left side of the, the left picture is that when you're coming back from this trip, remember if you do an in and out or even a loop, there are two rivers coming out of the Nina Moose Lake. That's Nina Moose Lake. And just make sure that you take the westernmost river when you come back. So you start out with 160 rod portage at entry point 16 or a half of mile portage and it is slightly downhill to the river. And, but when you come back, it'll be slightly uphill and you know, you'll be in such good shape, you won't even notice, but it's a beautiful trail. This first picture on my, of my canoe is right in the water, right after you would, we've uh, put in at the half mile portage. The second picture is, is actually myself on the half mile portage. So this is an overall view of the map of the area. The parking lot is off the map. Um, there are a few portages on the river on your way to Nina Moose Lake. There's usually three or four, but there could be more. Um, if the water level changes, if you have beavers making dams or trees block the way in some rapids, just be prepared for maybe having a few more. So basically, again, three or four portages to Nina Moose Lake, and then there are two portages from Agnes to, uh, from um, the river to uh, Lake Agnes. And I'm going to show you 
some of the things you might encounter. So this is one of the first portages on the left that you encounter on the river. It's actually pretty nice, it's pretty flat. And then on the north end of the river, you could actually hit a beaver dam or two. You just never know what you're going to hit. And this is after going through Nina Moose Lake and you've done the two longer portages, the 96 rod and the 70 rod portage. And this is a long stretch of paddling through wild rice, but it has a very hard bottom. And most of the time I've actually had to walk this section, but this particular year, the water level was high and we were able to paddle it. So most of the campsites on Lake Agnes are very, very nice. I've got three stars there that I've stayed at in the past and I'm going to show you some pictures of those. So, and then there's, this map is showing you the two ways out of Agnes. One is the 115 rod portage to Boulder Bay and on the upper part of the lake, it's two shorter portages going to Boulder Bay. So the one thing I want to show you on the left side there, that picture is at the end of the 115 rod portage in Boulder Bay, it's very, very muddy. So be prepared for that. You have to kind of try to scoot your canoe out there and you're gonna get pretty muddy. So this is a campsite on the north end of Agnes, right before you get to the two short portages. It, there's a bit of a hill, but there's a nice little beach and there's a really nice flat area for the tent sites. Now here's another campsite, one of my favorite campsites on Agnes Lake. It's like in the north central part of the lake. There's about three or four uh, campsites along the way there. It's a very nice uh, flat campsite. Um, it's very close to the 115 rod portage if you're going to take a day trip or if you're going to go continue to go on into Lac La Croix. And then this is at the south end of the lake. It, there's a lot of big, beautiful, rocky areas there. There's three or four port, uh, campsites there also. And you can see we're leaning up against some of the rock and it's nice and flat above us where our tents are. So those are three really nice options um, on Agnes Lake for campsites. And then we get to you, we get to Lac La Croix. So you go through Boulder Bay, there's some campsites in Boulder Bay. Basically, there's about 11 campsites in that southern area there. And I'm going to show you three different campsites. And I'm also going to tell you some points of interest in that area. So this is one of the campsites in Tiger Bay. I've stayed at this campsite, it's beautiful. You can see it's a great spot to swim, it's flat, there's beautiful views. And then just north of that, is on the north end of Tiger Bay is another great campsite. And notice how flat the tents um, are, the tent site is up there on the top of the hill and a big, beautiful fire pit area. And then just north of that on another island, is this beautiful campsite. I've never stayed there, but I've, I've admired it. And so I took a picture of it and I thought, oh my gosh, that's a beautiful, beautiful spot. So lots of, I've visited other campsites on Lac La Croix in that area and they're all really nice. One of the benefits of being in this area is that's very close to Warrior Hill and to the pictograph panel that's actually on the Canadian side. This is Warrior Hill. It's actually, in the Quetico, it's on the Canadian side. This is where the Anishinaabe actually ran up and down this hill. It's a thousand foot granite hill. Unfortunately, it is actually illegal for you to step foot on that hill and to walk up it. Although I know many people do. You're supposed to have an RABC, which of course they're not issuing right now. And, a, and you're supposed to have a day pass from the Quetico but it's beautiful to look at and just to think about the history that happened on that hill. Very beautiful spot. And just north of that, just past Warrior Hill, there are three large, large panels of pictographs. Now remember this is on the Canadian side, so you can actually paddle up to it and take pictures and leave tobacco. You wanna do that, I'll tell you about that in a few minutes. So there's moose, there's handprints, there's a human figure smoking a pipe, and there's, there's so many. It's a beautiful, beautiful spot to visit. And you can see on the map right where it is. Um, here, if you can see my pointer, here's Warrior Hill, and then you just go 
past this little bay and it's right here in this flat area right before this tiny little bay. And it's a long, long section of pictographs. Here's one of the panels. There's some hand prints there that you can see and there's a Mai Mai Guashi or a spirit. They're often pictured with their hands up. And this one is holding a spear or something like that. A historian that visited this site many, many years ago were told by the elders that these handprints were the Mai Mai Guashi touching the rocks. So if you look very closely, you can also see a, a turtle just be below our faces and just below that an elk. So here's the turtle and here's the elk with the horns. There's so many pictographs to see. It's just a beautiful, beautiful area. So pictographs, in case you don't know what a pictograph is, it's an image, a sign, or a symbol, which is created to express some idea or information. And the Anishinaabe left these on the rocks and they're anywhere from 500 to 1000 years old. They used sticks or their fingers to paint and they used a material usually made out of a red okra, which is a red material. And they bound it with some bear or sturgeon oil. They also usually it from their canoes. So they're at a certain height above the water level. And please do not touch or splash water on them, but just enjoy them. They've been there for a really long time. So the next slide we have here is, you know, basically, if you wanted to continue on and do a loop, we're going to talk about doing a loop from moose and you take the same route as I've told you from Lac La Croix and you could go through fish steak narrows and then go paddle if let's see we can paddle through here and then paddle on pocket and creek and then go to Gibiano Creek to Gibiano Quay Lake and then on to Oyster and then on back to Lake Agnes and back out again. Here's the Gibiano Quay Creek beautiful water lily filled stream and here i'm just gee um the fish steak narrows is actually underneath our faces i just wanted to point that out so we started here where this star is and we made our way through fish steak narrows and then up here to pocket creek again and then we ended up staying at this campsite right here there's five campsites on gb on quay there's also um, a famous, or I say loosely famous, a um, site with five rocks on a granite hill that I'll show you. If, there's, if those chairs could talk, I think it would be very interesting to see what people have talked about and what problems were solved. It's a really cool place. And let's, and also I just wanted to uh, let you know, you can catch some walleye bass and northerns in Gibianaque, or sometimes we call it GB Lake. This is the campsite from the middle site on the east side. And people from our group were swimming out to the island. And there is a trail leading from that campsite to the south to a beautiful hill, which I'll show you in just a moment. And we also fished right outside, right out in front of this campsite. It was really great. And as you can see, we caught some fish. We caught a lot of bass. And the, the hill picture is where you could just walk right out of camp about two minutes. And there's a beautiful place for you to sit, read a book, and just watch other people passing by. It's just a beautiful, beautiful spot. The next slide I'm going to show you is on all of the Voyager maps. And it shows that number of fish and the kind of fish and the size of the fish. And it's a really interesting concept that they have on those Voyager maps. And it's all the lakes that are on those maps are then listed. And um, I got some of my information from these maps. I think it's a really cool idea. And they got the information actually from the state of Minnesota. So now here is the famous chair site on GB Lake. It's on the southwest side of the lake. It started in or around the year 2000, a friend of mine took a picture of two chairs. And then another person says he actually started it in 2004. And this picture was taken in 2012. And I've seen pictures since then. 
And I believe they're still there and there's actually a table there too. Now it's not right at the campsite. The campsite's actually just down the hill and it's kind of small. So that's why we didn't stay there, but it's a beautiful site to visit. It's really, really a cool spot. So let's move on south from GB Lake. The next lake is Green Lake and then Rocky Lake. And there's actually some pictographs. I have some pictures of those on the lower left side. And then Oyster Lake. And we actually stayed on this campsite right here, if you can see my arrow, on Oyster Lake. When you complete this loop, you would go out Oyster Lake, follow the Oyster River, take the 160 rod portage into Lake Agnes, and then go back out on the Moose River. However, our group actually took the Oyster River all the way down to the Nina Moose River. It was in a very, very high water year. So only go past that 160 rod portage if you know it's a really high water year. One of my friends took that route and it took them nine hours once one time. So I don't recommend it unless it's really high water. So here's a picture of that campsite on the peninsula. It's a nice, it's a nice rocky spot, great for swimming. Here's another view. It's just um, a great, a great little spot on Oyster Lake. And then here's the Oyster River. It's very beautiful, but it gets narrower and narrower and narrower. And we had to follow the water current. We had to make sure that the, the weeds were going in the right way. And we, had, we, we were very lucky that we had high water that year. So let's move on to the classic route from Mudrow to Horse and Fortown Lake. And um, we're going to also talk about a day trip to some pictographs and the Lower Basswood Falls. So the Mudrow Lake is a very popular route. There are two entry points. They're actually entry point 23 and 22. I will just tell you that entry point 22 means that you cannot stay on Horse Lake. So I'm going to tell you about getting entry point number 23 so that you can stay on Horse Lake and then do a loop. Um, the parking lot is right where the Chainsaw Sisters bar used to be or saloon if you have ever been there before or had heard about it. So from that parking lot, it's just a short 30 rod portage down to the creek and then you go to Mudra Lake, Sandpick Lake, Tin Can Mike Lake and then up into Horse Lake. So one of the other interesting things about the Voyager maps is that they have this L on right by the portages. And so if you notice here, I'm gonna show you with my arrow, the first portage from Mudra Lake to Sandpit Lake is marked as an L9. So this is subjective, but if you look, it is an up and down. Uh, there's a lot of topographical lines. I've taken this many times and yeah, it's difficult. So that's pretty, pretty good. And then from Sandpit Lake to Tin Can Mike Lake, it says L4, that's 135 rods. It's a nice flat um, portage. There's a little bit of a boardwalk at the end and then there's a little bit of a ledge at the end of the lake. So that's actually pretty accurate. So you can look for those if you happen to have this kind of map and that will help you also figure out how hard your route is going to be. So here is one of my favorite campsites on Horse Lake. It's the campsite right at the mouth of the Horse River. There's a little beach actually. So here we are on horse and the star on the left is where that campsite is. And then I did draw a blue line to show you where the river is and showing all the curves and everything. Um, and so let's talk about a day trip from Horse Lake to Lower Basswood Falls. It will take you all day to go up there, see the pictographs, have lunch, fish, and then come back. You're going with the current on the way there and you're going against the current on the way back. And there are anywhere from five to six portages on the river. Some are very short, one's about 75 rods. So here's a little bit of a close up right when you get to Lower Basswood Falls. So you're coming off the Horse River. And what I really want you to notice is that I'm gonna tell you to go across to Canada. That orange line 
right here is actually the portage. So you go across to Canada, there's a beach there, you can see it, but don't get too close to the area where the current is flowing to the left. It's very, very forceful. So stay way to the right here and then go to the beach. And then this is where you can have lunch um, or you could go see the pictographs which are, which are up here where the star is. It's about a mile north of the portage. And then lots of people fish in this area. You could come back and have lunch after you've seen the pictographs. Anyways, it's a be very beautiful spot. You can also go to the right and see Wheelbarrow Falls. So it's a lot, a, there's a lot to do there. Here is the falls from the Canadian side. And the other thing I was going to say is that you can be in Canada on a portage. So don't worry about that. It's unlike Warrior Hill, there's not a portage there. So you're not supposed to, to be on that in that spot. There's lots of trails along that uh, Canadian side there. So you can get really nice views, lots of places to sit. And here we are having lunch amongst there's the cedar trees. And then a mile north are the pictographs or some people have called those the pictured rocks of Crooked Lake. And here are some of them. There's a close up. In the upper left, there's a Maimaguashi with the up the arms up and there's some very faint handprints there. The middle picture is a pelican and a canoe. And if you look very closely, I'll point it out with my pointer. There's a flag off the back of the canoe. And then here's a moose and another pelican. There's about 12 or 13 images on the pictured rock site. So then you go back to Horse Lake and the next day, or maybe the next day, you want to go to Fort Town Lake. You can take these two short portages that I've marked on the map there. And there's a 60 rod and about a 15 rod. And you can make your way to Fort Town Lake. And there are 16 campsites on Fort Town Lake. You can stay wherever you want. There's really good walleye and northern and bass fishing on Fort Town. Um, it's a really great spot to stay and here is the second campsite when you're coming from Horse Lake. The next campsite looks almost exactly the same. There's some just beautiful pine studded campsites in the area. So let's move on to another area um, just east of Ely, the Moose Knife, Vera, Ensign Lake area. That's another really classic, classic route. And you go out of Ely on the Fernberg Road and the entry point is number 25. And there are 27 permits issued a day for the Moose Lake area. So you would take Moose Lake and you'd go up through the Moose Lake chain, which is Newfound Lake and Sucker Lake and go to Birch Lake and then go to Carp Lake and then take the Knife River and then you're at Knife Lake. And then you could stay there for a few days and then you could do this loop that I'm talking about. So I'm gonna show you a, another kind of overall picture. And this is the, the, um, the old W.A. Fisher map. And you can see, I'm gonna show you with my pointer. Here's Moose Lake, here's Newfound Lake, Sucker Lake. Then you go to Birch Lake. And then you take this 48 rod portage into Carp and then you take the river and there's three to four, short portages on the river, and then you're on Knife Lake. It's a really nice, you can do this in about five hours and then you'll be on Knife Lake and there's so many campsites to choose from. But one of the main things you wanna do when you come off that first, that last portage off of Knife River is if you look straight out of the bay here, you're going to see the Isle of Pines where Dorothy Moulter used to live. And now here's the larger island and here are the two smaller islands. They're just little circles on this map. And this is Robins Island and there's two very nice campsites on Robins Islands. But you cannot camp on the Isle of Pines but you want to see this ribbon rock here. There's a great story about this. Dorothy's nephews put it in a fishing boat and brought it to her after she admired it. It was at a different part of Knife Lake. They plopped it right down by one of her small islands. So lots of people could see it. We stopped there every time. 
we get out right up here on this flat area. We can pull your canoes up there and then we walk into the woods and we have a beautiful little picnic spot. If you walk around some of the islands, there are perennials that have stayed around after Dorothy's been gone. Um, so every once in a while, you'll see a beautiful pink peony or something like that. It's, it's a beautiful place to visit. Um, so one of the next spots you can go if you keep going east from Dorothy's Islands and the Robin Islands, it's about an hour paddle to Thunder Point. It's a beautiful point. There's a little bit of a beach. You can pull up your canoe and you can take about a five to 10 minute walk up to this beautiful viewpoint. And you have this uh, beautiful view looking down the west side of Knife Lake. It's a great place to just stop and take a little break. So if you're going by, make sure you stop and check it out. So let's go back to the Isle of Pines area or the Robin Island area. And you want to go back into Vera Lake and into Anson Lake to make your short loop. There's a 196 rod portage into Vera Lake. And then there's a um, 168 rod into Ensign. Now they sound really long and really hard, but they're not. They do have some topography to them. Here's the portage from Knife to Vera. There's a little bit of a, some steepness here and there's a beautiful ridge and there's a beautiful ledge to land your canoe. So it's Vera Lake's a gorgeous lake. Here is a, here's a campsite on Ensign Lake that I've stayed at. There's lots of beautiful rocks in the kitchen, great place to swim. That's on the east end of Anson Lake. I've stayed at some other sites, but I, I'm just showing you this site today. Now, if you were to stay on Knife and you wanted to go to Kekakabek, you would go just past Thunder Point. As you can see, here's Thunder Point right here. And you would go down four portages south into Kekakabek Lake. So lots of people like to go there. There's trout fishing there. There's about six, 15 or 16 campsites. And it's just an easy way to get to Kekakabek. Um, you would go through Bonnie and Spoon and Pickle Lake. And there's only one steep portage that I can remember um, on the south end of Spoon Lake. So actually it's a pretty easy way to get into Kekakabek. So X marks the spot for the pictographs on Kekakabek, which most people don't know about. They're very, very faint. I'll show you a picture of it in a, in a minute, but there's the spot. So if you come off those four short portages, take a left and you can go try to see if you can find those pictographs. And I have a star marked on one of my favorite campsites, which looks like this. This is the fire pit looking out south and I have a funny little story about this. So I was there in 2019, but previously I was there 40 years before that. On my second trip ever, we stayed at this island campsite. I was with a group of friends and it was really nice to revisit it. It's a beautiful spot. There, you know, every campsite um, is unique and I, I just had some really good vibes about this one and I'm really glad I got to stay there again, 40 years apart. It's really pretty cool. Here's a picture of where that pictograph is. And it's kind of right about where that star is. So, you know, if you imagine you're in a canoe and you're painting and I've blown up the pictograph so you can see it and kind of change the colors a little bit because it's very faint. It's a canoe with probably five or six people in it. So look for it if you can, it's a really cool spot. And then leave some tobacco. It's always good to leave tobacco so that the Mai Mai Gwashis who are the little tricksters of the cliffs don't come out and move your canoe in the middle of the night. It's a really good thing to do whenever you visit a pictograph site to leave some tobacco. Let's move on to the east side of the Boundary Waters. And that would be up on the Gunflint Trail. And this is, um, from the trip that I took last summer, I visited Clearwater Lake and we base camped there. And then we took a lot of day, tri day trips from there. I did this with seven of my friends last summer. Here's the vintage picture of Entry Point 62, Clearwater Lake, 
the this part of Clearwater Lake, if you can see with my pointer, is not in the Bonnie Waters. So there's a really nice outfitting uh, lodge down here. Clearwater Historic Lodge is down here. So we actually spent the night in the Flower Lake campground the night before. Then we got up, pulled into the parking lot, which is kind of small. And then we took off and started and started going east on Clearwater Lake. I'm going to let you know there are 10, 10 horsepower motors allowed on the lake. People from the outfitters actually bring people to the Caribou Lake Portage and to the West Pike Lake Portage. Honestly, it didn't bother us at all. It was great. I, I go back there in a heartbeat. It's a great lake. Here is the campsite that we were at. We were at the very last campsite on the east end of the lake. This is looking east. This is looking west. Lots of uh, cedar trees, as you can see, lots of ledges, good for getting in and out and swimming. And this is the area, the living space area and the fire pit. We actually had room for a Nemo bug out tarp slash screen tent, but there weren't any bugs. It was great. So here's the map, the Voyager map, and it, the star is where we were located. So we went all the way to the end of the East Lake. You can also, I want you to also note that there's the, the green line is the border route trail, which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. But what we did for, the, for our first day trip, as you follow my pointer, is we paddled here and we took this 200 rod portage down into Caribou Lake. And it says L10, it has a rating, of the highest you can get. So you can see all those topographical lines. Um, don't let it scare you, especially if you're just going to take a day trip, you won't have a lot of equipment, but it was really worth it. I'm really glad we did it. And we went there to fish, four of us went there to fish. And as you can see, we did very well. We had one walleye and the rest were bass. And there are also Northern on the lake. We caught some Northern too. So we, we had a, just a really great day trip. So then I and another person took the two canoes back while Jane, my friend on the left, stayed back and cleaned the fish. And um, so this is where I was sitting on Clearwater Lake. Now that you're listening. Waiting on Clearwater Lake for Jane and Deb and Kathy Coda to arrive with the fish. There's a 200 rod portage. I cleaned the canoes, got the fish smell and slime off the bottom. I'm just listening to the water. So hopefully we'll all be listening to water pretty soon. If this winter will give up its grips on us. It was, it was a great spot for me to wait with the canoes. I, I actually just walked out to the water, dipped the canoes in, scrubbed them because everybody knows when you fish, you get a bunch of slime in there. And it was great. Um, it worked out really wonderful. So if you get a chance to be up there, Caribou Lake was a really great lake to fish. Then the next day we went to Johnson Falls. So here we are again, I'm gonna show with my pointer. This is our campsite. We took the 200 rod portage. We took a 25 rod portage into Little Caribou Lake. And this campsite right here on Little Caribou Lake is fabulous. Um, there were some people staying at it. Um, it's a great spot. And then we took, we walked the 80 rod portage. I'm going to show you a picture of it, but we actually left our canoes back here because we knew that we could walk the shoreline to the creek. So that's what we did. We took the 80 rod portage which is wide, gradual downhill to Pine Lake. And then we got to the shoreline. Now, if you wanted to take your canoe over and paddle a few yards, you go to this opening right here. But we just decided to leave our canoes back. This is my friend, Kathy, coming back from our trip. Um, but I just wanted to show you how low the water was last year. And we could actually just walk right across the creek. So we took the trail along the creek and we went to the two different falls. I'm going to call them the lower falls and the upper falls. So there's two falls. It's a beautiful area. We had lunch. 
the whole process took us about three and a half hours. So it was really nice. We saw a few people. Um, it is a popular spot to visit in the area. And um, if you're in that area, please try to try to, um, it's very easy to find the trail. Just follow the creek, and keep going until you see these beautiful falls. So here's another view of walking the shore on the way back. It, Pine Lake is just fabulous. It was just a beautiful day, kind of cloudy day, but that was really nice. And I'm hoping to get back there again someday. So here's that border route trail that I had mentioned before. And you can see that it is following the border, which is between Canada and United States. There's Watop Lake, there's M Mountain Lake, there's a Moose Lake down the down the to the right. And the border route trail was actually um, planned and built in the early 1970s. And there's 65 miles of it. And so it's right in this vicinity, which is really nice so that we could hike on it. We went to the west, we went to the east. So we had a lot of variety on this trip. And I'm going to show you what we did one day. One day we went to the west and we could access the trail right from our campsite, about two minute long trail and there we were. And we hiked along the trail. And then I actually took, took my, <coughs> excuse me, my phone out and took a picture of where we were with my GPS. There's Mountain Lake, here's Clearwater Lake. And then this is the exact spot that we were and I took a picture and this is the portage right here. This is a person right here, if you see with my arrow. And that's Watop Lake and this is Mountain Lake. So we walked there, had lunch, and then we walked back. The next day, and this is a little bit, a little close up you can see. So we walked up here and then we walked back. And then the next day we went to the east and actually the border road trail follows the portage almost into West Pike Lake and then it veers off. And so we went to the east the next day and here we are. There's a little video I wanna show you. So beautiful. The views on the trail were just like this. The whole way it was beautiful. We went to Gogebic Lake. We had took a little break. We had a little candy bar and water and the view was beautiful. There were loons dancing on the lake. There is, There are two campsites on Gogebic Lake and one was occupied. And it's just a beautiful little spot uh, just south of West Pike Lake. Speaking of West Pike Lake, on our way back from Gogebic Lake, we went onto the portage and then went to see the end of the portage. And it's this beautiful spot right here looking east. Of course, it's really hazy because we had all those fires last year, but what a beautiful spot. So one of the things that occurred in October at this very spot was a tornado on Clearwater and Caribou. And it happened, um, let's see, on October 10th, it was an EF2. And I think that it's a very interesting. I think that you should, if you have the opportunity, there is a YouTube video about this event. And Carrie Lane, who was a guide and outfitter for the Clearwater Historic Lodge, took his boat, went down here, hiked up the portage, and then made his way on the border route trail. And it's very interesting. It's so you can just see, he couldn't even get through parts of it. Now this happened in October. So I'm pretty sure that this is not, this has not been cleared yet, but I'm sure that they've got plans to clear it um, because a lot of people love to love to hike this part of the trail. So interesting, you know, a, the, the latest confirmed tornado on the Boundary Waters was this past year in October. So we're going to move on to another area off the Gunflint Trail, and that is Saganagal Lake and Seagull Lake. And I'm going to tell you about a loop that you can make. Um, so one of the really interesting things about this route is that it's known as a route that's easy and it's really good fishing because there's only there are only a few 
portages that you're going to take. Now, what I've done with this route is I've actually gone up the Gunflin Trail and I've stayed at Seagull Outfitters. They're right on Seagull Lake. And then they drive us to this point right here, which is Seagull River. And you take this channel and I either take a tow or you can paddle it, whatever you'd like to do. And then you're on Saganagal Lake. I personally really like to take the tow. So if you take the tow, you're brought up the Seagull River and you can follow the blue line here. And then you're brought out through these islands and you're brought out to Rocky Point. So there's over 50 or 60 or 70 campsites on this lake. You could just go out here and stay anywhere you'd like. The fishing is wonderful. Or you could get dropped off. Just be, just be aware that the wind comes from the west on Saganaga and it can be very, very hard to paddle into the wind there. And But there are a lot of islands that you can hide behind. I wanted to tell you that the state record walleye was actually caught in the Seagull River. So just right down here, um, right as it flows into Saganaga Lake. And that was caught on May 13th, 1979 by a gentleman. It was 17 and a half pounds. Well, just this past February, the end of February, their family, they've had that fish for 43 years. They donated it to the Chickwalk Museum, which is just off the Gunflint Trail. It's a great museum. If you're up here, you should try to stop and um, check it out. They have a couple of buildings, and one building is just full of old boats and motors. It's really, really cool. So check that out if you can. So that just shows you, I just wanted to point that out, that there's some big walleyes in Saganaga and Seagull. Here's a close-up of the area going from Saganaga. So Saganaga is north here, and then you would go through Red Rock Bay, and then there's a little lift over right here where the arrow is. And then you go to Red Rock Lake, and then you can take a portage, a 48 rod portage into Alpine, and then a 97 rod portage into Seagull. Now you can stay in Alpine, this is Alpine Lake. We stayed there one night. But if you look around, if you look in the background there, you see how short the trees are. This is from the Cavity Lake fire. And so you have to be really careful when choosing a campsite. You may not be able to hang your food, but there are 20 campsites on the lake. It's a moderate sized lake. It's a very nice lake. Here's our campsite. You can see the trees are really small, really short, but it's a nice flat area. We, had a, we actually had a great spot. So um, it's a beautiful lake, beside the fact that those trees are really short around it. When you get to Seagull, the 97 rod into Seagull is, is like a freeway. It's really nice. It's all sand. It's great. There are so many campsites on Seagull Lake. Apparently, there's a lot of campsites with beaches that would make it really good for you to stay if you were base camping or if you had your family. And it's a beautiful lake. I'm going to talk to you about a couple of hiking opportunities that are actually on the lake if you are tired of fishing because it's such a good fishing lake. One is the, on the left side there is the Paulson Lake hike. It's a 515 rod portage into Paulson Lake, which used to be known as Jap Lake on some of the older maps. And that was actually named for James and Ann, Ann Paulson. So now they just call it Paulson Lake. But on the right side, on the map is showing at the north end of Seagull Lake, there's a 209 rod portage into Grandpa Lake. So there's opportunities to take some long hikes if you want, do some exploring, have lunch, and then make your way back to your campsite. There are also some pictographs on Seagull Lake and they are located on an island. I have my, my Fisher map right here. You can see the topographic lines and I wrote pictos and right here on this point, right where that black dot is, is where these pictographs are. They're pretty faded. They're pretty hard to tell what they are, but you can tell that they're red and they've been painted and they're just above the waterline. So that arrow is also pointing to a, a spot known as the Palisades. So a lot of people apparently, and I'm going to do this this summer because I'm going to do this exact route one more time. And you start at the end here, we'll see where our little arrow is, and you can hike up to the top and I guess you have a beautiful view of Seagull Lake. Here's where we stayed last time. It was on the west side of the lake. 
when we got onto the lake from Alpine, we actually had a really bad storm approaching and it was super windy. So we took one of the first campsites we could to get off the lake and it was great. We had a little bit of a beach. It was a great view. We had a wonderful day. Now here, we're going to go back from the Gunflin Trail area back to the Ely area. And we're going to talk about one of the classic routes, the lake um, one through four, the numbered lake area and the Hudson and Insula trip and then with the day trip to fish dance lake so this is an in and out trip uh let's see here is lake one landing really all the way over here and then you could go all the way through hudson insula to alice lake and here are the pictographs on fish dance lake so the lake one entry point is at the very end of the Fernberg Road. So it's about 15 miles on the Fernberg Road out of Ely, dead ends at the, at the uh, Lake One entry point, the parking lot. So I have stayed in Ely the night before I do this trip, or I've stayed at the Kawishui Lodge the night before, which is the smiley face at the north end of the lake. And that's a really nice spot to stay at. It actually has 20 cabins. We stayed in one that was kind of like a bunkhouse. It was built in the 1920s and it's just got on the National Register of Historic Places. And this is where you put your canoes in um, at this beach. And so you can put in here, you can leave your car there, you can get your permit from them, and then you can go out on your trip and then come back. It's really a great spot. Whether you do that, whether you start at the parking lot or whether you start at Kawishui Lodge, there's only two short portages between Lake One and Lake Two. Um, and so between Lake Two and Three and Four, you're just paddling. There are about 50 plus campsites on these lakes and there's lots of walleye in Northern to be caught. And if you continue going East, like we did, you'll be taking some short portages into Hudson Lake and then a longer 104 rod portage into Insula Lake. Now the Pakami Creek fire actually hit this area pretty hard in 2011. I was actually there on Insula Lake the night the lightning hit on the Pakami Creek just south of Lake Two. And little did we know what was going to happen, but this was 10 years ago now, or 11 actually. So this is one of my favorite campsites on Hudson Lake. It's the island site. And I've heard that it didn't get affected by the fire, but I'm not really sure. But it's a beautiful view. We actually try to get this site on the way out so that we can get back to the parking lot sooner the last day of our trip. But let's go to Insula Lake. Insula Lake's a beautiful lake, multiple, multiple campsites. We stayed in the mid area there and there's lots of walleyes and northerns. It can be difficult to navigate, so just be really careful when you're out there paddling and make sure you have your map with you. The lower half of it was burned by the Pagami Creek fire. So let's talk about a day trip to Fish Dance Lake. If you look on the left, right here where this red arrow is, there's a 10 rod portage coming out of Insula Lake and you take the Kawishui River and then there's Alice Lake. And then you keep going and you take an 18 rod and a 92 rod portage and then you veer south and then there's a beautiful cliff there with the pictographs the pictograph on the right is supposedly an animal deadfall trap it's very unique i've never seen one anywhere else it's very very cool these are some of the other pictographs on that cliff the upper left i believe is a bear the lower left would be a canoe and the one on the right is, I've seen this only one other place on McAlpine Lake in the Quetico. It's depicting a shell and the lines coming out of it are supposedly power lines. The shell was a very important to a lot of the Native American people who came from the East originally. The shell, um, there's a pole shell story along with people moving East from the are moving west from the east coast and the shells were very important and so this is a really really cool pictograph remember if you go leave some tobacco put it on a ledge it's a re it's a really great way to have great weather for the rest of your trip i'm just joking but it, i do it every time 
So I wanted to show you the perimeter map of the Pagami Creek fire because two weeks after we were there, it kind of blew up and you know, the rest is history. It really um, was a really hard fire to fight because it was really hot and there were huge winds. Where the arrow is, is where Lake Two, where the Pagami Creek is. And so you can follow the perimeter. It's above Lake Three and Four and Hudson and half of Insula and just the south part of fish dance. So it's a big area. I have actually been in the, the area since then, um, in the south area, actually, by Isabella Lake. And it's, you know, the areas recovering from fires are beautiful. So um, even though there, there's fire damage, it's gorgeous. It's still, it's really a cool spot to visit. Now, one of the last, uh, the last area I'm going to talk about today um, is it was a very cool day trip that I took this past February. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the Hegman Lake pictographs. It's north of Ely on the, the Echo Trail. It's about 45 minutes north. And um, I've been there in the summer. A lot of people paddle there in the summer for a day trip, but I've never been there winter. And I was up there this winter and we took advantage of it. It was a beautiful day. It's a half mile portage to the lake. We actually used snowshoes part of the time and part of the time we walked. Some people were skiing in, a lot of people were pulling sleds and they were going to camp. We saw two or three um, official campsites that people were staying at. It was really cool. Here's a little very short video of us snowshoeing on the south or the west side of the lake. So it was two miles in and it was two miles out. And it's also one of the most visited places or the most visited pictograph site in Minnesota. Here we go, we're halfway there. We're on North Hegman Lake. There's a short portage between South and North. And then here we are, the, the cliffs are sticking out and you can, this is actually on the right side here is where people kept going up to Trees Lake. So this is in a narrows area here. The pictographs are on the left and I'm sure some of you have seen those before. The Mai Mai Guashi are a human form with the hands outstretched again. We have canoes, we have an X, we have the moose. The animal is probably a dog or a fisher or a wolf, not really sure. So let me show you the next slide. So unlike the other pictographs where people were in their canoes probably painting. See the ledge underneath the pictographs right here. They figured that someone probably sat there and actually did these pictographs. They're very, very well done. But I did manage to climb up right over here and with my snowshoes and just leave a little bit of tobacco right on the ledge here. <clears throat> Excuse me, it was a bit precarious, but it was a beautiful, beautiful day. Excuse me. I just wanted to um, end my presentation with letting you know that there's a couple of other events that the Friends of the Bondar Waters are sponsoring. Next Friday, April 15th, at the Bad Weather Brewing Company in St. Paul, you can celebrate spring and meet fellow Boundary Waters enthusiasts and fellow fish lovers. And you, they're having a fish fry. The fish, is, the fish will be served by the Northbound Smokehouse Food Truck. That looks like a great event. That's from four to seven at Bad Weather Brewing Company. And the next event is on Friday, April 22nd. And that's a Friends of Friends Earth Day gathering at the Minneapolis Cider Company. There will be indoor and outdoor seating. You can learn and play pickleball. You can enjoy Blueberry Boundary Waters Canoe Area Inspired Cider. And there's going to be some s'mores by the fire. And there's going to be live music also by Surge and the Swell. So that is the end of my presentation. And I just wanted to say thank you for allowing me to show you some great places to visit when you're in the Boundary Waters. And if I can, I'll answer any questions that I can. 
Great, thank you so much, Kim, for that uh, inspiring presentation, getting us all ready for uh, for the, the paddling season coming up and reminding us uh, that you can have fun in the Boundary Waters in the winter as well. So, uh, so that was really uh, tremendous. And going from the Echo Trail to the Fernberg Trail to the Gunflint Trail, covering all those all those inspiring trips there. Uh, there there are uh, a couple questions. Uh, one. Uh, one question was when when you go along the uh, the Canadian border there and some of those lakes, uh, uh, how often have you seen you know U.S. forests or or any sort of um, uh, border patrol uh, when you've been out out there? You know, I haven't really seen that many, but I do know that the Forest Service has hired a lot more people this year to be rangers and to go out checking campsites and checking the routes. They've done a lot of hiring because they, I think they felt that there weren't enough in the last few years or they hadn't had enough money to hire people. So I would say that there's going to be a lot more rangers out there this year, checking campsites and checking your permits and, and checking the portages and things like that. Great, thank you. And uh, you know, there's a, a question about uh, passports and, and access, maybe a, a couple of things to tee up uh, the, the question here. Uh, and you, you made the point, Kim, when you were uh, out by Basswood Falls there that portages on the Canadian side, you, you, can, you, can, you can do, you don't need a remote area border crossing permit or anything like that. Uh, but why don't you talk a little bit about that, talk about that and then, then talk about uh, whether or not we can get into the Quetico on the Canadian side this summer. Sure. So there's, there was a treaty signed many, many years ago that allowed anyone from Canada or the United States to use either portages on, on the border lakes. So you do not need a, a passport. You do not need a day pass from the Quetico. You do not need a remote area border crossing permit. You can use a portage on the border anytime you want. However, you know, um, we are not going to, it sounds like we're not going to be able to go into the Quetico from the Southern entry points this year. So far they have said they're not going to open them. They're not going to be issuing remote area border crossing permits again this summer, but you can go into the Quetico from the North. So you'd have to go through International Falls and Fort Francis, and then you could go into one of the three or four ent um, entry points that are actually on the north end of the Quetico, or you could drive all the way up to Thunder Bay and then go west on Highway 11 to get to the Quetico. Um, it's just unfortunate that they're not issuing the REBCs. And they're, from what I've heard, um, I talked to a local outfitter. She's, she talked to the superintendent, Trevor, of the Quetico Park. He said, we're not opening up the southern entry point, the ranger stations. So Cache Bay won't be open, Prairie Portage won't be open, and Lac La Croix won't be open for business. Unless it changes in the next few months, they change their minds, then I think people can go online and get permits. And then, but Thunder Bay keeps saying they're not going to issue RABCs this, this summer. Okay. And to clarify, let's say the, that magic wand was was waved and we could get in from the, those uh, southern entry points. You would uh, so you apply beforehand for the remote area border crossing that RABC per, uh, permit, right. and you have your and you have your passport, right? Right. So let's say next, let's say even next summer they open it up. You have to get your RABC. It's about thirty thirty five dollars Canadian. You. You have to, it takes about three to four weeks to get it from Thunder Bay. You have to send a copy of your passport. Um, and then you could, you, they'll send you a copy of it. You bring it with you, you go to the Quetico. And on the way back, you actually have to stop in Ely at the forest, at the ranger station with your passport. So you have to bring your passport with you or your passport card with you when you go on a trip into the Quetico. Um, of course, you need your passport if you're going into the northern um, entry points through International Falls or Fort Francis. You have to cross the border there, so you have to have a passport. Great, thanks, thanks, Kim, for that clarification. There was there was a, a question asked about uh, about renting canoes and. Uh, 
and and working with outfitters and 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 yes for those of you that don't have your own canoe there are plenty of outfitters in ely on the gunflint trail uh, along the north shore uh, uh, especially sawbill there and on our website if you go to our explore tab you can see a listing of a number of resources including outfitters as uh, in the Coistry Lodge that Kim referenced in her in her uh, presentation as well, you can rent canoes from there uh, as well. So so yes, so please um, uh, you know support the the outfitters and and they in turn are, are a wealth of information just like Kim on on having uh, great great trips. You know, there's a, a question that just came up. Uh, Kim talking about the the different times of the of the paddling season and about the bugs. Maybe you want to talk about when when the, the the bugs are more prevalent than 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 other times. Well, it seems like the bugs are more prevalent in May and early June, and then as the season kind of dries up a little bit and it's hot out, well, then the flies sometimes come out. But um, uh, and, and I think the mosquitoes are more prevalent in the morning and the evening also. So early, early part of the summer and the later part of the summer. And then if you're paddling in September, October, I don't think you have any bugs. One of the things you want to do, you can try to do if you're there in the summer, is find a campsite that's on a point that will get some wind. Um, if you find a campsite that's kind of tucked into the woods, you're going to have more bug issues. So, yeah. Great. There, we have another question, uh, a kayaker that's looking for, for trips with uh, fewer portages. Do you have a, a couple of recommendations for that, Kim? So I think a, a great trip with a kayak would be to go up the Moose Lake chain, go through Newfound and Sucker, and then you could take the Prairie Portage, 20 rod portage into Basswood Lake. Um, again, that's a Canadian portage, but you can actually take it to get into Basswood. And then you would stay on the US side of Basswood and you have just unlimited shoreline there, lots of campsites, lots of bays. It would be a great place to, to um, paddle to with your, with your kayak. The other place that I have kayaked is in the Quetico is actually, we put in on French Lake and then we there's no portaging between French Lake and Pickerel Lake, there's a river. And you could spend a week on that trip. Um, we've been, we, I've been on there two times with kayaks. It's a fabulous, fabulous place to go to. And so you can actually go there, you can go through International Falls or through Thunder Bay, and you could um, start a kayak trip in the Quetico this year on French Lake. Uh, Dawson Trail Campground is where you'd stay the night before, and Pickerel Lake is just one of the most beautiful lakes, lots of sand beach campsites, um, known for good walleye and northern fishing, and unlimited paddling. You can actually make your way all the way to Batchewang Lake. So there's actually a guy that has swam between Pickerel and Batchewang Lake. So anyways, it's a really, really great spot for kayaks. Great. Thanks, Kim. We also have a, a question, a specific question about the, the portage between Hudson and Insula. And I don't know if you can go back to your, your slide that has that, be, but they had trouble finding that, that portage. So maybe we could help out that viewer with uh, very specific information there. Well, let's see. Um, is that... Okay. Sorry about this. Okay, there we go. Well, it looks like when you leave Hudson, it gets very, very narrow and you have to make sure that you don't go up to the left, but it, it looks, you know, it looks like there's a campsite just to the north of the portage. I remember that, you know, it follows the, the river here and um, hopefully that could help you. I don't remember what it looks like specifically, but I think you just have to be careful that you don't go to the campsite or go north that way. Just kind of hug that shoreline and see that little point there. And I would say, then you'll come to the river and then just obviously you got to go to the left of that river, left, left of the, the creek or the river there. Great, thank you, Kim. And perhaps you could go to the, the slide that has the, the events that are coming up as well on the 15th and 22nd here. Sure. 
there we go. Super, super. You know, there was, there was a final question from uh, from a, a couple of viewers whether this uh, uh, presentation is being recorded, and 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 yes, it is, and you'll be able to access this uh, recording uh, through our, our website uh, at Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness and and our on our YouTube site, and we'll also uh, send out a link to it to everyone that that's viewing this as well, so you can send it to uh, uh, friends and family members to to get this great information that that uh, Kim delivered. So. Um, uh, Kim, we are at the end of our time here. I am so grateful for uh, for what you've uh, done for us and for all the viewers this afternoon. Uh, and I want to thank um, all my colleagues at Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness for helping put on the, the programs that we've done with, uh, with REI. Uh, thank you, REI, for having this uh, Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness Day uh, at REI. And uh, most of all, thank all of you for, for loving the Boundary Waters, for supporting our work, and for, for enjoying the wilderness. So, so thank all of you. Again, thank you, Kim. And everyone have a, a great afternoon. And we hope to see you on either uh, the 15th or the 22nd, either at uh, Bad Weather Brewing or Minneapolis Cider. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.